Welcome to the 71st Annual George Polk Awards in Journalism. Now more than ever, it is important to recognize the role journalism plays in telling the stories that impact our society. As we have seen over the last month during the global pandemic, journalists are on the front lines, many times risking their lives to provide necessary and crucial information from around the world. The prestigious George Polk Awards have honored the influential, investigative, thought-provoking work of reporters around the world for 71 years. And today, I have the honor to announce, on behalf of Long Island University, the opening of the George Polk School of Communications, a unique educational experience led by accomplished scholars and practitioners who excel in the professional world. The Polk School will be known for innovation in the areas of cutting edge of media, communications, and journalism. Graduates of the Polk School will carry forth the highest standards of professionalism and ethics, inspired by our extraordinary list of Polk laureates, such as Walter Cronkite, Edward R. Murrow, Christiane Amanpour, Peter Jennings, Norman Mailer, Seymour Hirsch, and many others. The Polk Awards have become one of the most prestigious awards in journalism, honoring exceptional reporters who are committed to uncovering the truth. And now I would like to introduce the curator of the Polk Awards, Pulitzer Prize winner, two-time Polk Award winner, and best-selling novelist, John Darnton. Thank you, Dr. Klein, and welcome to all of you to the George Polk Awards. You know, when our judges convened back in January in Brooklyn, we had no idea that now, a mere three months later, the whole world would be thrown into such turmoil. Strange to think, but even then the virus was stalking us and millions of others around the planet. We're disappointed that we can't congratulate our winners in person, as I imagine they are. Instead, we produced this video so that they can speak for themselves and they can tell the stories of how they got their stories. Now more than ever, I think, we need truth seekers and truth tellers. If we are to emerge relatively unscathed from this scourge, we need access to a free flow of honest, accurate information. We considered 551 submissions. Of them, we chose 15 winning entries, altogether to 23 reporters. I salute the winners and the runners-up and all the others who produced such outstanding work in 2019. I would like to thank the late Roz Walter for her financial support and the Nicholas B. Ottaway Foundation. Its funding allows us to give cash along with the prizes. I also want to express gratitude to Melvin McCrae, who edited and produced this video and to our incomparable citation reader, the award-winning journalist, Charlene hunter Galt. An enduring and saddening mystery of Central America is the refusal of violence to stop. Wars have abated and right-wing dictatorships have retreated, but the violence continues. Azam Ahmed, Mexican bureau chief for the New York Times, has told us why with vivid on-the-ground examples, killer gangs in Honduras, cartel assassins in Mexico, murderous police in Brazil, guns for asking in Jamaica, a father threatening his family in Guatemala. For showing how homicidal violence can permeate the cracks and crannies of societies in crisis, Azam Ahmed has won the George Polk Award for Foreign Reporting. The origin of this project began with a question posed by our international editor, who had stumbled on a statistic that even now haunts me. Latin America and the Caribbean are home to just 8% of the global population, yet 38% of the world's murders. Why is Latin America the most homicidal region on earth? How can more people have died here in the last 20 years than in every major war zone combined? I spent more than a year trying to understand, combing through hundreds of pages of research, speaking to experts, law enforcement, government officials, and more than anything, those living in the crosshairs of that violence. Our hope was to create a series that connected readers to these realities explain them through clear empirical research and deep narrative. To 
bridge the divide between the distant and often impersonal headlines that emanate from the region and the very real tragedies that people are often, that people are forced to confront alone on a daily basis. My parents migrated to the United States before I was born from Pakistan and I grew up in the South in the 9-11 era amid the racism and hate it generated towards Muslims. I felt it personally from childhood until as recently as a few weeks ago. As much as anything, that experience has shaped the work that matters most to me, a desire to seek out the commonalities that make us human, allow us to see and connect with one another on a level stripped of politics and judgment. For this project, I wanted readers to see that the violence visited on those who may speak different languages and live in countries we've never visited and contexts we can't imagine is not as far away as we might think. The young men fighting for their neighborhood in Honduras Lubia Sasvin Perez, a victim of horrific gender violence that forced her family to flee to the United States from Guatemala. Jody Ann Harvey, a single mother who was killed by a handgun smuggled from the U.S. to Jamaica in a case of mistaken identity. Or the community of Mormons in northern Mexico, whose lives were shattered when cartel gunmen murdered nine women and children in cold blood. Feel strange to win an award, writing about the suffering of others Mothers who lost children, children who lost fathers, communities that writhe beneath the weight of cruel and indifferent states where violence governs life and the absence of law. I hope more than anything that this award can bring more attention to their plight and the shortcomings of governments on all sides to address it, especially the United States. Thank you for the recognition. I wanna thank my editors, Greg Winter and Michael Slackman for their support, John Darton and the Polk Awards for their recognition. And more than anyone, to the dozens of people from Honduras to Jamaica, Mexico to Brazil, who shared their stories with me. A precious gift I can never repay, nor thank them enough for. Without them, none of these stories would have come to life. Thank you. Last May, the Syrian war deteriorated to a point where hospitals became targets for airstrikes, leaving scores of civilians dead. But who was responsible? The clear suspects, the Syrian government and its ally Russia, denied involvement. It was the new visual investigative team at the New York Times that exposed the Russians. Reporters Mark Scheffler, Malachi Brown, and other team members proved the case with digital tools that analyzed explosion patterns, social media posts of videos, photos, and eyewitness interviews, along with a trove of Russian cockpit recordings. They've won the award for international reporting. Hi, this is Maliki from the New York Times. Um, a breakthrough moment in this investigation was when we heard a Russian pilot receive GPS coordinates for a hospital in Syria and then confirming he had bombed it. Now, it was clear over months of reporting that hospitals were being deliberately targeted and Russia was a prime suspect in those attacks, but this for the first time was proof. Um, the reporting didn't stop there. Uh, we obtained flight logs, we had months of those cockpit recordings of Russian and Syrian pilots that we uh, translated and decoded. Um, and although we couldn't access the sites of these attacks, you know, eyewitnesses sent us uh, documentary visual evidence, um, including the metadata, which is very important um, because it allowed us to um, establish the minute that these attacks happened. And for the first time, we could relate what was happening on the ground with what was happening in the skies, and that was a big breakthrough. Um, after hospitals, we turned our attention to some of the most gruesome attacks on civilians last year on market and a refugee camp. And again, our process and verification methods led us to Russia in attacks that the UN now finally calls war crimes. Um, we're very grateful for this award, and we share it with the witnesses without whom we couldn't have done this work. Thank you. When the Trump administration separated immigrant families at our southern border, widespread outrage on a federal court order was supposed to end the practice. The public sense of urgency began to fade. But one reporter, Lomi Creel of the Houston Chronicle, never took her eye nor let us take ours off the chaos. She reported that children were still being separated and that asylum seekers were forced to wait in Mexican border towns controlled by drug traffickers. For her smart, compassionate, and groundbreaking reporting, 
Lomi Creel has won the award for national reporting. I'm thrilled and honored by this and very grateful to the Polk Awards Committee for recognizing my immigration coverage and to the Houston Chronicle for giving me the bandwidth to pursue off the beam track stories. My award is in part for my continued reporting on the separation of immigrant families at the border, which I first uncovered in 2017, months before the administration acknowledged it as official policy. At the time, the White House denied it and it all played out in the black hole. But thanks to the help of many, including public defenders in El Paso, I was able to interview separated parents in detention. My stories resulted in the release of one mother and helped spur the pivotal ACLU lawsuit that ended the practice. Except it left a giant loophole. And last year, I obtained an expansive federal database that showed the practice was still widespread, often for dubious reasons, such as questionable claims of gang membership. I also continued my series on a, a family who had been split apart by the Trump administration's deportation policies. And after three years of being in El Salvador and parenting via Facebook, Jose Escobar was finally allowed to come home last year. It's been a really difficult and intense uh, few years of immigration coverage, and I'm so inspired by all of my amazing colleagues across the country and the work that they have done. So this award just means so much. And of course, I'm also just endlessly inspired by the many, many immigrants who shared their lives with me and opened up their hearts, even when and often when it put their lives at such incredible risk. But they did it because they believed that what had happened to them was wrong. Thank you so much. I just mean so much. For years, profiteers have been conning taxi drivers, many of them immigrants trying to get a foothold in their new country. They sold them taxi medallions at inflated prices, steering them to loans they could never pay off. The scheme led to bankruptcy, suicides, and destitution for thousands. For unearthing this practice, resulting in criminal investigations, government reforms, and the promise of a bailout for the victims, Brian M. Rosenthal has won the Local Reporting Award. Hey, it's Brian Rosenthal at the New York Times. And this feels weird. Uh, it feels weird to be celebrating anything right now. Our project was about the hardworking immigrant Americans who drive taxi cabs in New York City. And as of today, 28 drivers have died because of coronavirus. And thousands of others are facing economic devastation because of the way society has changed basically overnight. We are committed to telling those stories, just as we are committed to telling the stories of all working class New Yorkers. So I guess what I would say about this award is it is a real honor to be recognized in the local reporting category, especially in a competition with winners from publications like the Seattle Times, the Houston Chronicle, and the Philadelphia Inquirer. I subscribe to all of them, and I respect them immensely. At the New York Times, we are an international publication, and we serve a global audience. But we care deeply about our hometown, and we focus on aggressively investigating the city and the region especially now under the leadership of Cliff Levy and Kirsten Danis, who edited this project. It is going to be a very tough time in the coming weeks, the coming months, the coming years for all of America, uh, for all publications, but especially for local publications. And it is going to be more important than ever for local journalism to be there as we pick up the pieces from this catastrophe. And so we are proud to stand alongside journalists from all across the country. Uh, we support them and we appreciate your support too. Thanks.
Millions of farmers around the world rely on information from the Agricultural Research Service of the U.S. Department of Agriculture. But Helena Bachmiller Evich of Politico has revealed the Trump administration's Agriculture Department has systematically repressed studies from the key research division warning of the dangers of climate change. As a result, the world's leading expert is silent on the singular issue its own experts consider the gravest threat to food production. Helen Botmeyer Evich has won the Environmental Reporting Award. Hi, my name is Helena Bottomiller Evich. I'm a reporter at Politico and I cover agriculture. Uh, thank you so much to the Polk Committee for this incredible honor. I am delighted to accept it on behalf of myself and so many people at Politico that made this series of stories possible. Uh, really, it all started when I was driving home from visiting my grandma in western Pennsylvania. I had some time to kill and I decided to call uh, a source that I hadn't talked to in a couple of years and check in. Uh, this source was a scientist who mentioned that they had uh, recently done a project with a scientist at the Department of Agriculture and they mentioned that department officials had gone out of their way to dissuade coverage of and promotion of the study and also that they mentioned that other scientists within USDA um, were pretty frustrated uh, in the study pertained to climate change so this obviously perked up my ears I thought you know I'm gonna ask around about this at this point we hadn't really heard much about um, any sort of climate suppression going on at USDA it had been considered much different than what was going on at places like EPA and Interior. So that one tip led us on almost a year of stories. Uh, I thought initially it would just be a one-off story um, in the beginning, but one thing led to another and there was so much to tell. It was ended up being a much bigger story and much bigger series. Uh, I really want to thank Carrie Budoff Brown, our wonderful editor at Politico, uh, for encouraging me to take all the time I needed to do this story to really go for it. You know, she pulled me aside and really said, I think you have something, just go for it. I would have, you know, I'm a busy beat reporter. I would have just probably done a story or two and just moved on. So I really thank her for that vision and commitment. Uh, so much gratitude also to Peter Canellis, the wonderful, wonderful editor um, on this series. He guided me through a lot of reporting questions and strategy to get this done right. I also want to thank Patterson Clark um, from our data point team. He did the graphics and all the reporting uh, on the data side to really um, visualize what was going on there and also really paint the picture for the reader of just how much um, things have changed at USDA. I also of course have to thank Scott Mahaskey, our fabulous photographer. Um, he and I actually went to Iowa and Missouri and Nebraska and got in a, you know, a big pickup truck and drove these washed out roads. Luckily he got us out of being stuck in many, many deep uh, ruts and, and you know, potholes in the road. So uh, he was really an intrepid partner in telling this story visually as well. So thanks so much to so many at Politico, so many on the production side as well, who made this possible. And thank you again for this award. I'm truly humbled um, to accept it. Thank you. Two different cities and two different mayors drummed out of office by investigative reporters in Baltimore, Luke Broadwater of the Baltimore Sun heard a legislator complain about accessing medical contracts. The offbeat remark led him and his colleagues on the path of unscrupulous insider deals at the University of Maryland medical system. One of them brought Mayor Catherine Pugh $300,000 for unused children's books she had written. Having resigned in disgrace, she's now serving a three-year federal prison term. In Wichita, Kansas, Chance Swain of the Wichita Eagle was pinch hitting at a city council meeting when something about a $500 million water treatment contract struck him as odd. Months later, he and two colleagues produced a multi-pronged story of contract fixing that helped drum Mayor Jeff Longwell out of office and out of politics. For rooting out corruption, Luke Broadwater and the Baltimore Sun staff, and Chaz Swain, Jonathan Shoreman, and Dion Leffler of the Wichita Eagle share the Political Reporting Award. Hello everyone, Luke Broadwater here from the Baltimore Sun, joined by Danielle Broadwater. 
and we are making a quick video to say thank you to everyone involved with the Polk Awards uh, for the award this year. It's a, it's a big honor for the Baltimore Sun. We haven't won a Polk Award since 2007, and so everyone's very excited about it. Uh, to bring you up to speed about um, the investigation that we did at the paper, um, for those of you who haven't heard, um, we uncovered a self-dealing scandal at the University of Maryland medical system through a combination of tips and source reporting and Public Information Act requests and good old-fashioned dogged beat and investigative reporting. Um, it had it promoted uh, widespread change within the state of Maryland. The mayor of Baltimore, who was involved of it, with it, uh, resigned within a few weeks after the scandal broke. The uh, CEO of Maryland's largest hospital system resigned, as did many of the um, top lieutenants there. Uh, sweeping reform legislation passed that um, caused the entire board of directors at the hospital system to turn over. Um, and so a lot of uh, important reform and a strong eye on corruption came about because of our reporting at The Sun. Uh, unfortunately, we can't be there in person this year to accept the award. Danielle was excited about going to the American Girl store in New York. Uh, so we'll just uh, have to make this video instead and, uh, and say thank you. So ready? One, two, three. Thank, thank you. you! My name's Chance Swain. On behalf of the Wichita Eagle and my colleagues Dion Leffler and Jonathan Shorman, we would like to thank the George Polk Awards Committee, Curator John Darton, and Long Island University for this tremendous recognition. The measure of any investigative story is did it change things, and did it change things for the better? We believe this project made our community a better place to live. Our series of stories titled Special Treatment covered two distinct elements, government and politics. On the government side, we questioned our mayor's fitness for office after uncovering favor peddling on a $500 million water treatment project. On the political side, we showed the depths his supporters would go to save his failing campaign, exposing the creators of a provably false, dark money funded ad that hurled sexual harassment charges at his political opponent. In November, that mayor lost by double digits, drops out, dropped out of public office, and now works as a car salesman. Thank you to our newsroom leaders, Gene Hayes and Michael Rohrman, for believing in our work, and to our publisher, Tony Berg, and regional editor, Mike Fannin, for providing us with the resources to do journalism that is not only of public interest, but is in the public interest. Although this is one series by the Wichita Eagle, it shows our paper remains committed to local journalism that matters. In these trying times, making sure that work continues has never been more important. Thank you. Given the persistence of housing segregation in Long Island, editors at Newsday decided to find out exactly how much protection federal law afforded home buyers. Three years of intensive reporting produced a painfully definitive answer between little and none. Long Island Divided, a 45,000 word series exposed an endemic pattern of racist discrimination by realtors who routinely steered home buyers of color away from white enclaves. The article sent shockwaves through the real estate industry and won the staff of Newsday the award for Metropolitan Reporting. Greetings. Newsday's Long Island Divided Project uncovered evidence of widespread disparate treatment of minority homebuyers by real estate agents. Long Island is one of America's most persistently segregated suburbs. Many have said that the divisions merely reflect the choices people have made about where they want to live. But Newsday posed the question of whether real estate agents were solidifying the divisions, denying equal opportunity with potentially profound consequences on the quality of lives and futures. Newsday answered the question through undercover testing on par with the largest ever executed by government. Crucial differences. Newsday covertly recorded the agent's actions on video, analyzed the placement of their listings by census tract demographics, named the agents and detailed their conduct. Seeing and hearing agents treat white and minority buyers differently was searing. Newsday devoted three years to Long Island Divided. The investment of time and effort was well worth the price. 
Long Island Divided sparked extensive action by government, not least because behind the project sweep, it showed how evidence of being treated differently affected our black, white, Hispanic, and Asian testers on a deeply personal basis. My name is Arthur Brown. I was among the more than 50 Newsday journalists who made Long Island Divided happen. I want to convey on behalf of Newsday how honored we all are to have been judged worthy of a POC award. Thank you. The 2017 Federal Tax Code contained a provision to spur growth in economically depressed areas. Why not create special opportunity zones to lure investors there by giving them tax breaks? On paper, the idea made sense, but the reality turned out to be different. Some investors exploited the provision to build instead high-end luxury projects. For exposing the practice, the award for financial reporting goes to Noah Buhayer, Caleb Melby, and David Kozienischke, as well as Lauren Leatherby of Bloomberg News. Hi, I'm Noah Buhayer from Bloomberg News. I wanted to thank the organizers of the George Polk Awards on behalf of myself and my colleagues, Caleb Melby and David Kozienewski, as well as our editors, Robert Friedman and David Shear. Back in 2018, we all got interested in a little notice piece of President Trump's tax overhaul called Opportunity Zones. The idea was to get people to invest in some of the poorest parts of America, but we quickly found out that there were lots of opportunities for abuse. Uh, for starters, many of the zones were in parts of America that were doing just fine. Uh, and as we dug a little deeper, we found out that investors were proposing projects that just really didn't seem like they'd help the poor. And then on top of it all, uh, some of the president's friends and family seemed like they were rushing to cash in. Uh, there were many points during this reporting that uh, were difficult, required lots of digging and shoe leather reporting, but there were also moments that were just bizarre and made us laugh. Uh, for instance, we found a manufacturer in Oregon that had raised millions of dollars to produce $300 sex toys in an opportunity zone. Anyway, it's been an adventure and we're just thrilled for this honor and wish we could be there in person to celebrate with the other amazing reporters uh, who also won awards. We hope everyone stays safe and healthy through this crisis, and thank you again. The Glenn Mills School, a reform school for boys sitting on an 800-acre campus west of Philadelphia, had a nickname, the Harvard of Reform Schools. It was anything but. After reporting that a counselor there had body slammed and choked a 17-year-old with chronic asthma, Philadelphia Inquirer reporter Lisa Gardner unearthed a disturbing number of abuse claims going back decades. For tenacious reporting that closed the nation's oldest reform school, Lisa Gardner has won the Justice Reporting Award. Hello, uh, this is Lisa Gardner. Um, I just wanted to say how excited and grateful I am to be this year's honoree for Justice Reporting. Um, Obviously, none of us do this work for the awards, but it's um, a really great honor and um, such a kind thing. Thank you. Um, it's my name on the polk, but uh, this is really a credit to all the boys and men and other sources who came forward, um, many of them who were being actively threatened by the Glen Mills schools. I know I was being harassed and targeted by these people um, who'd been running this place for nearly 200 years and didn't want to see their way of life exposed um, for these boys and anyone. It's not um, an easy thing to talk about the worst thing that ever happened to you. And I'll just be forever in awe of their um, courage in speaking up in the hopes that other boys wouldn't have to go through the violent and brutal abuse that they endured at the Glen Mill schools. Um, as reporters, we can't promise anything to these brave people. Um, we can just hope that their testimony will spark change. Um, I hoped so much that it would, uh, but I think I was the most shocked when um, within hours of the initial investigation running, uh, judges from Philadelphia to California to Texas to Michigan started pulling their boys out of Glen Mills 
and uh, within six weeks, multiple state investigations, uh, Pennsylvania ordered the emergency removal of all boys from Glen Mills and revoked its licenses, shutting it down, um, ending the run of the nation's oldest reform school. So uh, the state's currently overhauling its entire juvenile justice system and uh, oversight thereof. And uh, it's, it's been an exhaustive but, but true privilege to, to report on that as it unfolds. Um, I want to thank my editor, Jim Naff, uh, and all my friends and colleagues on the Philadelphia Inquirer uh, investigations team. We really are a team and I leaned on them and their experience as I reported these stories. Um, this was the hardest thing I've ever done, uh, this kind of emotional work. And I especially want to thank my husband, Nat, who has been um, a rock, more of a boulder <laughs> for me. Um, yeah, the world is changing. Uh, it's hard to think of anything but the coronavirus. Um, I know a lot of the work we did in 2019 must feel like it's from a different planet. Um, but as programs like Glen Mills are quarantining, closing themselves off to visitors and inspectors, I feel so lucky that I found this story before the virus, um, because otherwise all those boys would still be trapped there right now with even less oversight um, and they would be in more danger than ever. That terrifies me and um, I'm just really grateful that it unfolded when and how it did. So um, <laughs> thank you, Poke Awards. Uh, please stay safe out there. We will get through this. Um, all the best and uh, yeah, thank you. In the American South, many Blacks pass land from one generation to the next through so-called heirs property law instead of wills reflecting their mistrust of the courts. Lizzie Presta of ProPublica discovered just how well placed that mistrust was when she discovered that unscrupulous speculators use legal loopholes to lay claim to the land, uprooting lifelong residents from their ancestral homes. For her account, The Dispossessed, published in The New Yorker, Lizzie Presser has won the award for magazine reporting. Thank you so much to the George Polk Awards Committee for this tremendous honor and for using your platform to elevate what I believe to be a truly important story. I came to the story through a statistic. A friend of mine told me that only 1% of American farmers were black. And I wanted to understand how that could possibly be true I knew about USDA discrimination against black farmers, but when I looked into the scholarship, I found this small corner of literature on heirs' property and how our legal system had been set up to discriminate against families who had not written wills, when black families had very good reason to be suspicious of white supremacist courts and avoid will making. I wanted to describe the legal mechanisms involved in dispossession of black landowners in the rural South. But once I started talking to families, I also understood that I needed to explain the emotional toll of losing ancestral land and a sense of home. I want to thank my editor at ProPublica, Alex Zayas, and my editor at The New Yorker, Deirdre Foley Mendelssohn, for shepherding me through this. And I have the most enormous gratitude to the Reels family, who let me into their lives and trusted me to tell what has been an extremely painful experience trying to hold on to their family land. Officials were tight-lipped when Craig Whitlock of the Washington Post sought details of Lessons Learned, a five-year, $11 million study of the Afghan war. They eventually complied, but not without a fight. It took two lawsuits, three years, and countless hours of research for Whitlock to crack the identity of 32 witnesses and produce the Afghanistan Papers, A Secret History of the War, summed up by one general as, we were devoid of a fundamental understanding of Afghanistan. Craig Whitlock has won the award for military reporting. Hello, I'm Craig Whitlock with the Washington Post. I'd like to express my heartfelt thanks to the Polk Awards and to Long Island University for their steadfast support of the best in American journalism. The longest war in American history has dragged on for more than 18 years. Amazingly, there has never been an official, thorough, transparent public accounting of what went wrong. It took publication of the Afghanistan Papers 
to reveal that senior U.S. officials systematically failed to tell the truth about the war and that they were hiding the magnitude of their mistakes from the American people. I'm deeply grateful to my editors at the Washington Post. They didn't blink when I asked them to sue the federal government for a bunch of documents that I thought might, might shed new light on the war in Afghanistan. And they didn't back down when the government stonewalled us for three long years. Instead, they gave me the freedom to dig, encouragement to think big, and the space to write the story in a fresh way that struck a chord with millions of readers. Finally, I'd like to thank an exceptionally talented team of colleagues in the Post newsroom who brought the Afghanistan papers to life with a gripping mosaic of documents, photographs, video, and audio. Thank you. In investigating the two deadly crashes of Boeing 737 MAX, the Seattle Times reveals serious problems in the FAA certification of the jet's faulty flight control system. The investigation established that Boeing misinformed the federal regulator about key features of the system, that the regulators relied too heavily on Boeing's safety analysis, and that analysts at both organizations were pressured to speed the approval process and avoid costly changes. For their revelations about the crashes that killed 346 people, Dominic Gates, Mike Baker, Steve Militich, and Louis Cam are honored in the business reporting category. Hello, I'm Dominic Gates, the aerospace reporter for the Seattle Times. Our team here is honored by the award for our coverage of the 737 MAX crashes. Our work got national attention first uh, in March of last year just a week after the second crash, when we published uh, a long piece about the flaws in the software that had caused the crashes. That was, that was the result of months of reporting before that. And we followed it up uh, later with scoops about what had gone wrong inside the FAA to certify the airplane, and what had gone wrong inside Boeing to miss the flaws in the design. Uh, our work uh, got national attention, it brought in uh, national press who also did great work and and I think the US press has done tremendous job in scrutinizing Boeing as a result of this. Kudos to my team, uh, reporters Mike Baker, Lewis Cam, Steve Militich, and editors Rami Grunbaum and Ray Rivera. Thank you. The imprisonment of as many as one million Uyghurs in western China was a major news story in 2019. An investigation by John Sudworth of the BBC helped establish the extent of the human rights violations of the Muslim people. From satellite photographs, he showed the systematic demolition of Uyghur neighborhoods and mosques. He recounted tales of abuse from refugees abroad, and he put the lie to a tour he was given of one facility that was sanitized to look like a harmless school for Chinese culture. For his intrepid investigation, John Sudworth has won the Television Reporting Award. One of the insights that my work on Xinjiang has given me is this. We sometimes make the mistake, I think, of assuming that the abuses of the authoritarian regimes of the past would have been obvious to us had we lived through them. This simply isn't true, of course. Germany in the 1930s had plenty of admirers, many of them powerful and influential. The Soviet Union had its fellow travellers, and China today is no different. The point of journalism, of course, in any society, is to dig, is to look for the hidden truths. And what I've learned is that in authoritarian societies, you just need to dig that much harder. So I've been extremely lucky to have had the support of an amazing team dedicated to doing just that, to uncovering the certainties on a story that China works very, very hard to hide. Over the past few years, I've spoken to some of those from Xinjiang who have had their lives torn apart. Parents who may never see their children again, children who don't know where the rest of their family are. And telling those stories has been humbling, but it is also fraught with risk, not just for those who choose to speak to us, but for some of those involved in the reporting as well. And so I dedicate this award to each and every one of them. 
There may never have been a journalistic enterprise as ambitious as the New York Times Magazine's The 1619 Project. It was a reinterpretation of American history that marks the nation's beginning, not with the Declaration of Independence, but with the arrival of the first slave ship on Virginia's shore. From there, it documented the centrality of slavery in the American experience and the efforts of African Americans to advance the nation's express democratic ideal against all odds. For this extraordinary effort, we present a special award to Nicole Hannah-Jones and the contributors to the 1619 Project. My name is Nicole Hannah-Jones. I'm a staff writer at the New York Times Magazine. I remember the first time I saw the entire 1619 Project laid out at the end of the process of publishing the magazine a few weeks before the publication. We print out all of the pages and lay them out on a wall in the conference room. And I walked into that room and saw the entirety of our work for the first time, and I became overcome with emotion and just broke down in sobs. I'm not the type of person who cries in a newsroom, but this project was so important, and the weight of what we were trying to do to capture a 400-year legacy of such a brutal but important institution, it was a lot to deal with. And um, I had a lot of fears about whether we would be able to do what we set out to do. When I saw it all laid out, I saw its power and I saw its beauty and I saw its pain. And I realized that all of the dozens and dozens of people who had worked to make this project possible had created something that we could truly be proud of. So it is such an honor uh, to be receiving this award on behalf of the 1619 Project and all of the New York Times staff and all the contributors who made it possible. I want to give a special recognition to the editors who saw the vision of this project immediately when I pitched it, to Jake Silverstein, who's the editor-in-chief of the magazine, to Elena Silverman, who's our features editor and my editor, and ushered in um, so many of those essays, and to Caitlin Roper, who oversaw our special section, which really is a, um, a living paper museum of the history of slavery. None of this would be possible without uh, them, as well as all of the contributors who appear in the pages. So thank you again, Polk, for this tremendous honor. And that's it from the George Polk Awards. Thank you for your attention and be safe.